Hello, and welcome to the Satellite Image Deep Learning Podcast. I'm Robin Cole, and it's my pleasure to present another technically focused episode in the series. In this episode, I catch up with James Gallagher to learn about the latest AI innovations reshaping image annotation. Our conversation covered significant new models such as Segment Anything, Grounding Dino, and Remote Clip, and discussed how these models can be linked together to enable new capabilities. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, James. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Robin. How are you? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Really looking forward to hearing about what you're up to. Um, do you mind giving us a quick background on where you work and what you do? Absolutely. So I'm James. I work at Roboflow um, on our marketing team, and I'm responsible for uh, not only a lot of our written content, um, as, uh, but also our open source projects. So I uh, help out with supervision, a popular library used in um, computer vision applications, auto distill, which I hope we can talk a bit more about for automatically labeling images. And I also spend a lot of time exploring kind of the frontier of where vision's going. So playing around with foundation models like remote clip, uh, hugging faces, eye effects and um, Sam, uh, really anything that I think can help accelerate us towards what I think the future of vision will be where we don't have to label as many images anymore and we can just get straight to model, straight to value. Fantastic. Yeah. Annotating imagery is very time consuming. And I think for me personally, I've been very excited by all these new innovations, which can speed up that process while not reducing the quality of the annotation. So what's the state of play today? What is possible on, on a platform like RoboFlow? Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to share my screen quickly and talk through a demo. And um, so one application of, let's see here, one application of uh, the segment anything model, which Facebook released earlier this year, is automated labeling. Segment mm -hmm. anything allows you to, as the name suggests, segment anything in uh, in an image and do so at scale. You can run segment anything. In this case, we've got it running in the RoboFly annotation tool and just go from image to image. And rather than drawing bounding boxes or indeed clicking and clicking and doing polygon, zooming in, zooming out, uh, refining, and indeed if you're working with other labelers trying to convey how they do that properly, it's difficult. So mm -hmm. we integrated SAM within two weeks of its release. Um, and on my screen now, I'm zooming into an image of aerial solar panels that I have in RoboFlow. Mm -hmm. And throughout, I can go and highlight over particular parts of an image, say a swimming pool, part of a roof, um, or indeed a solar panel. And rather than uh, rather than draw a bounding box around it or those labels, I can click and keep refining from there. And mm -hmm. um, in this case, I can just enter, oops, save my label. If I wanted to start labeling trees, for example, I could of over mm -hmm. trees. And this is, yeah, one way where we make labeling faster, particularly with aerial imagery, where oftentimes objects like solar panels or roofs or airplanes are very distinct from others. So we find it's really effective on the first shot. And you can also refine your annotations too from there. Right. So a big, big time saver. Um, and segment anything itself, was that trained on any aerial imagery or is this just a property of the model that can generalize well to aerial imagery? Absolutely. Um, segment anything I've found to generalize well to a range of different object types. So uh, in some of my testing for aerial imagery in particular, like airplanes and some features done airport have has worked really well. Um, the data set was vast um, and I haven't looked inside. Um, but yeah, from aerial imagery all the way to uh, labeling animals uh, to uh, segmenting windows uh, for surveying and property uh, management, uh, we've seen excellent results. Mm -hmm. In terms of the experience using it, um, so it will segment anything you say, but it won't tell you what that is. You still need to say this is a tree, this is a, a roof, something like that. Exactly. And that's that's an unfortunate drawback. But segment anything was so revolutionary that it's like we're lucky to have it. But we are engineering around that. So segment anything um, in particular uh, can't tell you what something is, but other models can. So one thing that we're experimenting with a lot of RoboFlow, and we're going to have a product announcement coming out in the coming weeks for this, is helping you automatically label images by chaining these models together. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about the framework 
framework in a moment. But one idea that we've had is like grinding dino, for example, a popular zero shot object detection model, which now finds its way into the backbone of various other research projects, um, can be combined with segment anything. So I can say to grinding dino, tell me where all the planes are in this image, and it will find the planes. And then I can say, run SAM only on those regions and get the plane. So now what I have is a label for uh, a segment mask and a bounding box for all the airplanes on image with a label already done. Um, so yeah, we're definitely not there yet um, in terms of being able to generalize across lots of objects, smaller objects in particular pose a problem, but definitely we're trending towards, let's combine some of these models together and, and see what we can do. Right. And so as I understand it, segment anything you can interact with in a couple of ways, but one is to put a box around something you care about, and then it will annotate the edges of that. But you can also generate multiple boxes and it will put edges around multiple uh, objects in that case. So the idea here is one model produces the box and then segment anything comes in and says, this is the boundaries of that, that thing that you've got a box around. Exactly. Um, and one other way, I just described like use grinding dino to do object detection. But another thing you can do is combine grinding dino, SAM, and a third model, clip, to refine your predictions even further. So um, this comes down to my playing around with models a lot um, and just figuring out which one works best for different use cases. But one combination we found work exceptionally well is grinding dino, SAM, and clip. Grinding dino finds, say, all the airplanes. Uh, Sam segments out those airplanes and then Clip does a more refined classification on those. So let's say I want to know, given, uh, let's say I have a ground uh, view of airplanes on tarmac and I want to know how many Lufthansa planes are there or how many Aer Lingus planes are there, I can use Clip to do that classification because it has such general knowledge. And so I get that bounding box, I get that mask, and then I replace the label from my initial like airplane with something more specific. Um, and one example I can share with you here um, from a project on which I worked recently, um, which is now trending on GitHub today, is um, me trying to label logos. Uh, so Grinding Dino and Sam doesn't know what a log uh, what McDonald's logo is, but it knows sort of what a logo looks like. And here I gave uh, Grinding Dino the prompt McDonald's, Sam gave me segmentation masks, and then Clip, I gave it like Burger King, McDonald's, and a couple other brands, and it did this really well. So particularly for that level of like refined um, classification, brand detection, um, or indeed like analyzing the status of something like, is this food half eaten? Uh, Clip is sort of coming into play. Mm, and clip that takes text inputs, or you can also supply sort of some like template and examples. Say that's a great question. And um, so, in uh, there's kind of two ways in which I use clip. First is here is a tech. Here's a couple of text labels. In this case, like McDonald's, Burger King, or if I was doing uh, something like let's say product uh, detection, it might be different product SKUs or like brand names or something. Um, and but with that said, Clip doesn't know everything. Um, we can get around that limitation, though, by using the Clip embeddings and sort of playing around in a couple different ways. So if I'm doing just a plain classification task, I could like train a linear probe using Clip embeddings and then use that to help, um, uh, help classify, uh, with which we find good results. And Joseph, our CEO, has been playing around with that for a few years now in his spare time, just excited about the possibilities. But also, and one thing uh, we haven't quite got out the door yet, but it's coming soon, is labeling images using Clip, but rather than the text label embeddings. So let's Let's say I know um, what like 10 different um, vinyl records look like, for example. Then what I can do is calculate a clip embedding for each vinyl record cover and then use clip to label uh, those images. So now rather than just saying, give me, does this contain a vinyl record or not? I can say, does it contain Taylor Swift's Midnight's? Does it contain uh, John Baptiste's We Are? And indeed, I use that example in particular because I used um, I used Clip to automatically label some images, um, and I'll talk about how in a moment. And I gave it 40 images, uh, Clip and Grounding Dino labeled them all, and it, it took me only two minutes of human review. And now I had a fully trained model which could identify 10 different vinyl records. And so <clears throat> we're going, we're, well, we're uh, increasingly going from here are 10,000 images, I've got to go find an outsource labeling team. And in the case of, um, 
let's say uh, government images that's not a given you've got to uh th there's high requirements there in terms of security clearances available to even see images or if you're working with tax documents site source labeling uh, it's more difficult to get going but if we can start saying let's just use these models to label images we can save a lot of time money and again as i mentioned earlier get to value quicker and then get an active learning loop going and refine our model over time Mm -hmm. I want to dig in a bit deeper onto the embeddings side because there's lots of different ways of creating embeddings and you might imagine having a custom model say on some medical data or some other kind of data that's not common like the examples you've shown how would that then fit into a, the sort of pipeline you've outlined here absolutely um so here I will introduce auto distill and then I'll talk about how it could specifically be used for that use case. Um, so auto distill and let me share the readme. Um, also to sales a framework that we've been working on for about nine months at Roboflow and we're continuously refining it. And we're also getting feedback literally every week about how we can improve it, what we can add. And also to still is helping progress us from where we are right now, which is humans do most of the labeling for a lot of use cases and to reduce the amount of human involvement. The ideal paradigm towards which we're striving, and we see this as an intermediary step, is uh, machines label images, humans review and QA those images, and then you train a model. Um, and then eventually maybe that QA time will be reduced, um, but we'll take stepping stones. So what Auto Distill does is it takes a large foundation model like SAM Grounding Dino Clip and allows you to label images with a simple and standard API. So the API works the same across Clip as it does for MetaClip, which is uh, Meta AI's uh, version of Clip. Same with Alt Clip, uh, which does bilingual um, embeddings and indeed object detection and classification. So what we want you to be able to do, and here's an example on screen of, we literally just fed also to still a video of milk bottles and now we can identify all the bottles. Um, not perfect, there's some, some false positives there, some overlapping detections, but again, for no labeling, that was amazing. And then we get to, let me scroll down here, this API here, and I'll zoom in, where what we can say is, I want to use grounded SAM. I want to label the shipping containers in this image, and I want to save those in my data set with the label container, because that's the ontology that I'm already using. Then I can pass in a whole folder of images, grounded SAM, which is grounding Dino and SAM combined, will iteratively run over all of those, save it in a YOLO data set, and then I can just plug that straight into a YOLO model to train on my own device uh, using, again, uh, a similar API. So I could replace YOLO V8 with YOLO V5 and do the same thing. Um, and I can, yeah, train a model. I could upload it to Roboflow for deployment, then you get our API going. Um, or um, indeed, if you need to do that QA stage, instead of training on your own hardware, just upload your images to Roboflow, then refine them and figure out, is this working? Um, and we also have uh, powered by supervision, the ability to visualize predictions in a few lines of code. So if you're like, is this actually going to work on, um, let's say, my aerial imagery? And it might not because some of these general models don't work well on those more specific refined classes. Then you can test it out, see how it goes. Um, and one anecdote I can give is uh, we had a research project at Roboflow uh, where we were building a logistics data set. We wanted to identify 20 different classes from a wooden pallet to a forklift um, to people to um, safety violations, including not wearing a safety vest um, on a construction yard. 100,000 images of which approximately 70% were also labeled with also the still. The model combination we used there was uh, DTIC, which is a, a slightly older model by Facebook that just worked really well for the classes we were doing. We labeled those images and then we had a YOLO model at the end. So instead of having like the two to five second inference time for DTIC, if I remember correctly, we went down to being able to see multiple frames a second with a YOLO model. And that's where we want to be. And when it comes to remote sensing, that's where we want to be there too. We don't currently support remote clip, which I think is a really promising uh, remote sensing model, but we want it to be that simple where you say like, hey, classify these images with remote clip, save them into classification data set, train a model, or do the same with object detection. And as I mentioned earlier, you can combine these, do maybe um, uh, grounding dyno to find the planes, then remote clip for um, more refined classification. Mm-hmm. 
it's really interesting just to take a step back and think how the the process of creating data sets is changing then we're moving from people manually identify all of the pixels and that's where the time is spent probably more to refining which choice of models you use to generate these predictions and how you then update those models really to, to improve the predictions Absolutely. Um, and like I've mentioned Grinding Dino a lot, and of course, GPT uh, and its vision capabilities are on the horizon. Uh, we're seeing some interesting performance. And indeed, uh, we're going to be releasing a tool this week uh, to that shows uh, GPT running on different prompts so that you can day by day see how it's changing, see if it improves that document classification, uh, or sorry, uh, document OCR, document understanding, graph understanding, all these things. Um, that's a side note. I just like uh, sharing things beforehand. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, these big models like Branding Dino and Sam are amazing for more general objects, but we do we do see a world where you're kind of yeah, combining these models together. It does involve a little bit of understanding and also exploration. That's sort of where I've been spending a lot of my time um, is just understanding what models were out there. So of course, I keep mentioning it, Remote Clip, it was trained specifically on a data set for remote sensing and achieved state-of-the-art performance across a range of benchmarks for a zero-shot image classification. Um, and so, do I think GPT is going to be able to identify all these very specific things in remote sensing? Probably not, because that's not their goal to refine on these very particular things. But it is someone's goal because it has importance. So we we want to yeah help people make, bring these models together, label your data, do a bit of human QA, have a trained model in the end. Yeah, you mentioned uh, remote clip and how that is trained on remote sensing specific data. I think. There's quite a few domains where you can imagine that happening, like medical imaging, remote sensing, probably other sort of specialized domains. Uh, many of these data sets, as you previously mentioned, being used for training foundational models. What's the sort of bigger context there about how foundational models and the sort of models you've just been talking about relate to each other? Absolutely. Um, so with regard to, um, I guess, the way things have been going for a long time in machine learning, particularly over the last five years, has been that uh, every so often we see just a transformational innovation that changes the model architecture itself. So, of course, over the last 10 years, we're familiar with going from like AlexNet to RNN, CNNs, transformers, and so on. But now what we've found is the data is what really matters. So these architectural improvements, they're crucial. We want to make architectures faster. We want to make them more accurate, but equally, uh, like the old adage goes in computer science, garbage in, garbage out. And um, if you don't have good data to start with, you're not going to get a good result. And so what I love about like initiatives like Remote Clip, and indeed I expect we'll see, and maybe they already exist, specific models for medical imaging. We have IBM's foundational models, which they built in collaboration with NASA for um, things like flood segmentation. Um, and even Facebook was doing like aerial surveying for tree canopies, and they had some depth sensor data in there too. Um, it's all about what data you have available. I feel like we're going to continue moving towards this paradigm where large models like, say, GPT cover a lot of the general cases, like here's a chart give me a number or here is an image. Tell me if there's a person too close to a forklift. Like that in itself used to take so much engineering and so much time and GPT can sort of solve it. But if it comes down to, um, I have this medical image and I want to identify an abrasion or a tumor, um, then we're not going to rely on these large models. We're going to have refined, fine tuned models for that use case developed by experts in that field. And so that's, um, yeah, that, I recommend just checking out the archive uh, <laughs> uh, papers that come out every day because oftentimes you see words like remote sensing, distillation, um, the medical imaging, and all these other things because people are exploring it. We've got the architecture, now we need the data. That's really a good summary, thank you. Um, how much data is required, in your opinion, to make a useful foundational model? Is there an infinite scaling that the more data is always going to make a better model? Or do you think that at some point people just say this is enough data now we're done with this and we'll move on to something else? Absolutely. Um, so, clip. Um, one of the 
Like they use millions of images, um, to, and not only images, but also the text language pairs. And for these general models, like say GPT, they have the advantage of internet level scale. So they can crawl the web and to develop text pairs, there's many things you can do. You can uh, like look for words that are closely associated to an image, look for alt text and build those labels from there. Um, but when it comes to remote sensing, privileged data, um, it's not possible to do that. Uh, you may already have a repository of data, but even in the case of Clip, there was still that human stage where you need to verify your labels. You need to uh, make sure that your labels match up to your images. So data quality becoming even more important there. Um, in terms of the size of a foundation model, I, I don't think we've converged upon any particular even range um, of how many images you need. But there was an interesting revelation earlier this year that helped sort of change the way that we can think about these models. So we've spoken about SAM a lot. It's a really powerful model, segment anything. But uh, a researcher uh, came out and uh, took a small percentage. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers in the range of like 10%, if not less, of the data uh, that was used in the data set to train segment anything, and they trained uh, a smaller model with that smaller percentage of data. Was it as accurate? Were the masks as clean as what I just showed you on that solar panel? No. But was it reasonably accurate? Yes. And can it run on your Mac without almost crashing the machine on the lower end uh, model? Yes. Um, and so that's that has me thinking about like Clip, Sam, a lot of these data sets are trained on millions, if not billions, in the case of Sam, uh, of images or masks, indeed, annotations. Um, perhaps there's a world where as these architectures improve, as data quality improves, we find out that you need fewer images to train a model for your use case. Um, and again, it's all about need too. So Fast Sam was uh, a great name because it is faster. Uh, Fast Sam um, comes from the angle of like, and it's integrated of auto distill too comes from the angle of hey uh, sam is slow let's make it faster your predictions aren't going to be as accurate but again human uh, reviewed um can't be done there but more importantly you can do active learning and if it doesn't work out and you've only spent an hour building that model that's okay and um, maybe another model will come along later on that you can just plug right in and hopefully with auto distill you change maybe three or four words to say the new model once we've packaged it up and run it on your data set and maybe you'll see something really interesting that's really interesting perspective um well, thank you so much for this summary. Uh, if people want to follow along your updates, because there's so much happening and you seem to be really on top of this particular aspect of it, where's the best place for them uh, to follow you? Absolutely. So for Auto Distill in particular, we have a GitHub organization, uh, which is github.com slash auto distill. There's a lot of repositories there. We cover models from Clip to Blip uh, to Grounded Dino to SAM to GPT. Um, there's a lot for you to play around with. Um, interestingly, one person once left an issue to say that uh, Auto Distill saved them having to manually label 14,000 images. Uh, and it was like, I got my weekend back. Um, mm -hmm. So that was exciting. So Auto Distill on GitHub also just the RoboFlow GitHub organization in general, where right now we've got a new repository coming out called Multimodal Maestro, which introduces new labeling techniques for working with multimodal models, implementations of set of mark at the beginning, and we're looking towards more. Um, and as always, RoboFlow.com. We've got a demo on our homepage where you can play around with the uh, uh, model trained on the Cocoa data set. Uh, it's really fun just to uh, feel computer vision running in your browser. And then from there, we have a plet uh, plethora of resources which will get you to labeling, using SAM to, uh, to um, refine your labels, uh, as I showed earlier, uh, training models, and then deploying your models at scale. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much again. I'll put all the details in the show notes. And until next time, thank you. Thank you, Robert.